transportation system, one of the largest uh, investments in transportation uh, and infrastructure in American history, certainly the largest uh, since the investment in the interstate highway, and we're creating millions of good paying jobs. Democrats deliver, and this House, uh, despite the skeptics, passed the Build Back Better Act, where we are going to create additional jobs, millions of them over the years. Cut taxes for working families, middle class families, and low income families, and lower child care costs, health care costs, the high cost of life saving prescription drugs, higher education costs, and do something decisive to deal with the climate crisis. Democrats deliver. Republicans are having a complete and total meltdown. Liar, clown, trash, grifter, nuts. What happened to the kindler and gentler Republican Party? It doesn't exist. They're having a complete and total meltdown. Instead of focusing on the problems of the American people, they are attacking each other. It's not a three ring circus, it's a four ring malignant circus. And the so called leader has no control over what's happening. And the American people are hurt as a result. But Democrats are going to continue to deliver on behalf of the American people, it would be nice if we had a functional party on the other side of the aisle that could focus on the economy, on inflation, on the problems of the American people, but instead they're focused on attacking each other and trying to prove loyalty to the cult. Shame on them. It's a disgrace over there. But Democrats are going to continue to deliver for the people. Let me yield to our distinguished vice chair, Pete Aguilar. The chairman's on a roll, and I don't want to interrupt uh, the, the word salad of uh, Republican conference scra uh, scrabble that, that we play. Um, as we mentioned last time, the last time we were here, we talked about Democrats delivering the Build Back Better agenda. Uh, we did that. We passed our bills. Uh, we continued to support the creation of jobs, supporting middle class families with tax cuts, lowering health costs, and addressing climate change. That's what we're going to continue to be focused on, is legislating and delivering for the American public. We look forward to our steps this month to deliver on that promise, to continue that. We look forward to the Senate doing their work and sending us back something that will make Americans' lives better. Uh, with that, uh, the chairman will answer all your tough questions. <laughs> First question. Uh, yes. So I know that you haven't yet committed um, on Rep Representative Boebert um, to a specific measure. Um, Congressman Bowman has called for Boebert to be both the first and the assignment. So I'm wondering um, what message you think that sends to some of your members if the Democratic caucus, given that the Republican caucus likely isn't going to act on this, doesn't take strong enough measures. Let's focus on the second part of your question. Why isn't the Republican conference going to act on this? What more does Kevin McCarthy need to see? I mean, what more does this guy really need to see? He's got Marjorie Taylor Greene completely out of control, Gosar out of control, Lauren Boebert out of control, crossfire. He's trying to mediate the dispute, can't do anything. And we think this guy in this conference is going to solve problems on behalf of the American people. They can't. So as Pete indicated, we're going to continue to focus on dealing with the challenges facing the American people. We're going to focus on crushing the virus, focus on creating an economy that works for everyday Americans and making sure uh, that we allow for opportunity in every single zip code by building back better. Now, as it relates to consequences for Lauren Bo Boebert, 
Certainly, I think there are active discussions underway to make sure uh, that Lauren Boebert is held accountable, particularly given the likelihood that we may not see any accountability coming from the four ring malignant circus on the other side uh, of the aisle. But hope springs eternal and we'll see what emerges uh, over the next day or two. At the same time, we're continuing to have discussions, leadership, House Democratic Caucus, uh, to make sure that we support our colleague. Because clearly, this type of dangerous rhetoric is endangering Ilhan Omar. And it endangers other members of this Congress. And words matter. We saw the consequences of dangerous rhetoric on January 6th. Can you say more about which options are on the table? Uh, I'm not going to get out ahead of any discussions that we're having in terms of leadership uh, and the caucus. I actually wanted to ask you about uh, threats against members based on, on the voicemail that uh, Representative Omar played uh, last night. Can you talk about how, how your members are feeling about uh, the security here at the Capitol, the security at home, the level of threats they're getting? Uh, you know, how much of that is drawn from, the, from this kind of rhetoric from January 6th, et cetera? Well, I've said a lot on this issue. These, uh, these discussions are ongoing, and of course, our chairwoman of the uh, House Administration Committee, of which Pete sits on, so maybe I'll yield to Pete, and he's obviously also on the January 6th uh, commission, but these are active uh, conversations that are underway. Notwithstanding that, the House Democratic Caucus's commitment to delivering for the American people remains steadfast. We are in the midst right now of doing at least a thousand infrastructure events across the country by the end of the year. To make it clear, what has been done with tremendous leadership from President Biden, we've had infrastructure week after infrastructure week after infrastructure week forever in this town, never yielded anything. And now we've got a new era of robust infrastructure in America. And Notwithstanding whatever the threat environment may be, and certainly it's exacerbated by the reckless Republican radical rhetoric on the other side of the aisle, we are going to continue to do our jobs and communicate with the American people on infrastructure and on building back better. In order to address the work that is so important to the American public, members have to feel safe doing their jobs. And I think that's kind of the root of, of your question. And I don't think the American public um, uh, focuses a lot on this. And, and it's something that the chairman and I care a lot about is uh, the fact that some members continue to feel uh, threatened, um, uh, both here uh, by their colleagues or by folks sending you know, emails and, and text messages. Um, it's it's sad. It's an unfortunate part of, of what we have to deal with at times. You know, we need to make sure and Chair Lofgren, you know, focuses on this, that members, you know, feel safe and we have every tool uh, available to us to think through uh, security protocols, uh, to work with our staffs and our district offices uh, as well. Uh, I'm pleased that Democratic leadership and Chair Lofgren, you know, have made those resources, you know, available and continue uh, to keep an eye uh, out for that. Um, so that's going to be a focus, is making sure members on both sides of the aisle are safe doing their jobs. Um, unfortunately, it feels that some of our colleagues on the other side, um, you know, uh, don't share that, that focus and are doing things that actively uh, promote uh, those threat levels, you know, increasing. Do you, if I make this real quick, are, do you hear from members currently that are concerned about their safety either in the building or at home? I, I think... I speak for the chairman that we hear from members on a range of topics each and every day, um, and this is this is one of them. Uh, this is this is something that we continue uh, to have you know discussions about and and are focused on uh, our members, uh, making sure that they can do their jobs uh, both in their district uh, and in here in D.C. I actually have one question for you, Congressman, if I can. A January 6th question. Not, not, no disrespect. <laughs> um, 
you guys had a little bit of a breakthrough yesterday with Mark Meadows agreeing to testify in some capacity. What do you think he can tell you that nobody else can? I think it's important that we tell the full and complete story about the events of January 5th and January 6th, uh, everything that happened from the election uh, until that point, uh, the, the president's focus, the former president's focus on uh, continuing to, to fan the flames of disinformation. Um, and I think uh, that uh, his former chief of staff will uh, give us a, a glimpse of that. Um, but I think it's also important to focus not just on the the, the substance of the conversations that, that those two had, but you know clearly uh, he had a lot of uh, interaction and conversations on the campaign side. And so I, I think we're gonna have a lot of discussions on, on his efforts, uh, both working um, uh, outside of the building uh, as well as, as uh, the official capacity that he held. So I think that there's a lot of, of questioning um, there that, that can be done. And uh, we look forward to, to his cooperation and we'll assess um, what the next steps are uh, after his uh, uh, discussion and deposition with us. And, and on Jeffrey Clark, he, you guys are gonna vote tonight um, to start the contempt process with him. He's not a household name. How important of a figure do you think he was behind the scenes during the lead up to January 6th? Yeah, just the public reporting alone on on the Senate Judiciary report, um, you know, clearly shows uh, that that Jeffrey Clark uh, was a key effort within the Department of Justice, using the brand of the Department of Justice uh, to continue to uh, uh, stoke the the, the fear um, uh, and the misinformation campaign uh, that the former president waged, and uh, the fact that his two superiors have uh, already spoken uh, publicly. Uh, to the Senate committee as, as well as uh, to us, um, you know, shows us uh, that that uh, he shouldn't have anything to hide. Um, but unfortunately, uh, that's what he's afraid of. So we'll exercise the next steps uh, and we'll bring it to the full House uh, floor um, after the business committee of uh, this evening. Uh, well, uh, you know, I'll let uh, both, you know, Steny Hoyer and the speaker, as well as uh, Chairwoman DeLauro, you know, speak specifically uh, to that issue and then uh, yield to Pete, who's on the appropriations. This brother's on a lot of important committees here. <laughs> um, uh, yield, yield to Pete uh, on it. But I think um, we've done our job and the Senate. Democrats are prepared to do their job as well. The problem is Mitch McConnell, uh, you know, the sort of king of obstruction on the other side of the Capitol, playing games, not wanting to even negotiate a year-end spending agreement to provide for the needs of the American people. And apparently, some of the more extreme members of the Senate uh, Republican group want to even shut down the government, probably because they think somehow creating chaos, which they're masters of, will hurt President Biden. It's not going to work. We're prepared to act. We need the Senate Republicans to step up and do their job. I'm sorry, were you saying that McConnell's not negotiating on the omnibus or on SBR? It's not clear to me. He's certainly not negotiating on the year-end spending agreement, otherwise known as the omnibus. But it's not even clear to me, but Chairwoman DeLauro may have more visibility into this, that he is meaningfully uh, negotiating on uh, reaching a reasonable continuing resolution. That remains to be seen. Go back to this side. Republican Mike Lee has been quoted in favor of this thing that he thinks that the Democrats should delay enforcement of the vaccine mandate uh, for at least the length of the continuing resolution. And uh, so are you saying you're not willing to do that? Haven't seen, you know, Senator Lee's comments, but I think we're in the middle of a public health crisis and vaccine requirements 
are reasonable public health measures at this particular point in time. We are in a position now uh, to be able to decisively deal with the implications of the Omicron variant because of the steps that have been taken by President Biden and his administration, who has led a serious effort to crush the virus, not suggesting that the American people intake Lysol or dismissing the virus uh, as something that was going to disappear in a few days, or that there were 15 cases and we were going to go down to zero. That's where we were a little over a year ago. It wasn't a serious effort. It was dangerous what was coming out of the former White House. So I haven't seen Senator Lee's comments, but I've got full and complete confidence in what President Biden and the administration and Dr. Fauci have been doing and will continue to do to help the American people make it through the COVID-19 storm. Let me just add to that, because um, unfortunately, you know, Senator Lee isn't the only one here. There are folks on our side uh, of, of, the, um, of the Capitol who have said similar things. And the fact that they want to walk right up to a government shutdown um, over a public health issue it should frighten the American public. Uh, that's exactly what they are advocating here. And um, in the Senate, I don't speak Senate, but apparently they need you know everybody to sign off on these things. And so whether it's one or whether it's 15, you know, Republicans, um, unfortunately, you know, that's going to impact um, government that could impact government services uh, come Friday evening. Uh, this is you know, everything from you know, military members pay to, to projects underway to uh, national parks. I mean, this isn't anything that anyone should root for. And the fact that this has become such a mainstay for uh, the Republican Party is just it's just frightening. We'll come back over to this side in a minute. Yeah. Thank you. Um, a philosophical question. Why not? Um, I'm Representative Bogart. Understanding the real world, world danger of inflammatory rhetoric, personal attacks, understanding all of that. At the same time, she was elected uh, by her district. You know, and that's something in this body, we don't have complete divisions of the offices of what you do with that vote. Under, how do you weigh that here? We seeing there are different, those who are always specific, Marjorie Taylor Greene specific is another specific case. They're all different on perhaps the spectrum. How do you weigh taking action, taking away the power of the voters in her district um, versus what is the standard for when you do that? Well, we needed to act as it related to the situation with Paul Gosar, and we needed to act as it related to the situation with Marjorie Taylor Green, and we're going to need to make sure that Lauren Bolbert is held accountable for her hatred, for her bigotry, for her Islamophobia, and for jeopardizing the health and safety and well-being of a fellow member of Congress. Those discussions are, are ongoing uh, on the House side in terms of the Democratic Caucus, and I don't want to get out ahead of it because it would be inappropriate to do so. Well, I was a political science major, not a philosophy major, so I don't want to uh, go down that, that road. I think this is a Pete Aguilar question, um, <laughs> but but no, but 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 and I, I want Pete to address it uh, because he's worked very. Because she said younger, younger Democrat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is like a comedy act going on today, but just yesterday in Georgia, off year, right? Not even a midterm, off year. Off election day, because it was a runoff. 
Democrats flipped seven municipal seats across the state in the heart of Dixie. And guess what? That brings the total number of municipal seats flipped in Georgia this cycle to 48. So the notion that all is lost when we've got fresh evidence at this moment in Georgia that Democrats are not simply breaking even, but winning seats. Yeah, it's a divided country. Virginia went one way, New Jersey went the other, and there's great news coming out of Georgia. Why? I think because Democrats are delivering. And that certainly has been apparent to the American people over the last several weeks with one, the signing into law of the infrastructure agreement, two, the House passage of the Build Back Better Act, three, President Biden taking decisive action to deal with inflation and supply chain issues here in America as part of our effort to drive down the cost of living for the American people. And apparently some folks in Georgia took notice and we flipped seven seats, building upon the more than 40 seats that Georgia Democrats flipped in November. So there's a lot of data to be processed. Some may point in one direction to try to elevate a popular narrative amongst the radical right. There's a lot of other information that says that the American people are starting to pay attention to the delivery that is being executed upon by the American people led by Democrats in the Congress led by Joe Biden. Yeah, I don't have anything more to add except to say that, that you know, we're going to deliver the president's agenda and we're going to deliver for the American public. Uh, that's our focus. There'll be plenty of time uh, next calendar year uh, to talk about politics. Uh, that's a long way away. Um, and we're going to focus on, on doing our jobs. That's what members each and every day talk to us about is delivering these improvements. We're going to do, as the chairman mentioned, a thousand events among House members. Uh, over the next 60 days, uh, working with the Democratic Policy and Communications Group uh, to highlight the focus of infrastructure and job creation uh, back home in our districts, the importance of uh, extending the child tax credit. All of these things are going to deliver for the American public. And when we can tell that story, uh, when we can uh, talk with them about what this means in their daily lives, we'll let the politics lie where they may. We're going to focus on, on doing the work to get there. Last question. We'll go to somebody who hasn't asked yet. Yeah. Uh, two things, if I can. So one, the, one of the voter videos, if I can circle back to that, is from the <coughs> from New York. Um, and one of your fellow New York delegation members in the background, who happens to be running for governor, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on what he's, if, what he should be saying in response to all of this. And then second, uh, Tom Suozzi says that some people told him to stick around. Were you one of those people? Uh, well, you know, I don't want to get into gubernatorial politics on either a side of the aisle. Tom Swazi is a great uh, member, a great public servant, uh, and I certainly wish him well moving forward. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>